Good morning and welcome to all. Happy Sabbath to you. To you who are here with us for the first time, like my good friend next to Sister Lilith, call her my good friend now, having I met her just over a week ago. For you who are following us over the internet, we want to give a special shout out to Sister Atwell's family down there in South United States in the state of Tennessee. And um, there are several other persons that are following us over the internet. We don't want to be overly discriminatory, but we want to identify you specifically because we know you are there and you are following. For you who are here before me, welcome. And indeed, like the brother said, we have had some precious experiences during the week while we're here together. So as we continue our, into our final day, may our hearts being open, our vessels turn right side up. We might receive that which we know we've come for. I just want to read here something from the sound we just sound, because it is my burning um, heart's desire and a driving force. The thought here is in the last verse, Jesus, make me holy thine. Then there is love at home. And I don't want us to imagine that we can have love manifested without the agape love on the girding, permeating, and controlling us as individuals. You know, I am conscious that in forums like these, in which there is the internet, and which there are the regular ones up front with me, and people long and desire to have a better relationship, they seek to go it and doing it as it were of their own. But I'm suggesting to you, if it is to be permanent, revival must have ex be experienced with the Spirit of God being made your spirit. So I want us to be very conscious that while there are things being said that are encouraging that seem to be suggesting that the husband or the wife is not doing what God designs. It is still never done except the spirit of God becomes our spirit in the truest sense of the word. So be conscious of that and don't try to obey God without having God to be the God of your life. I invite you at this time to prayer as we start to go on. Our Father, we thank you for the assurances of your love in Jesus Christ. We thank you that in him we have life and a more abundant life. That life which puts all those who believe in him in contact with you, making your spirit their spirit. And now as we continue in the area of family, we ask their Lord that we might allow you, who is the head of the human family, because of what Christ has accomplished for us, we might allow you to be truly the Lord of our family as individuals. Grant us your presence now and have mercy upon us, we pray, in Jesus' name. I want you to open your camp book, The Gospel and Family Life, with me. A very short chapter, chapter 7, we took a, a slight mention of it, but I want to go into depth, detail. And for those who we haven't welcomed as it were, and you're following us for the first time, you're more than welcome as well. This chapter is entitled, The Palmer Worm, the locust, the canker worm, and it should be and the caterpillar. 
Our text comes from the book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 4. And let me do something I like to do. Could you stand and read this text with me kindly? It is in your book. Therefore, you shouldn't find difficulty finding it. Joel, chapter 1, verse 4. On the count of three, we shall read in unison. Two, three. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locusts eaten. And that which the locusts have eaten, left, the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. These destroyers are diff Sorry, sorry. That is the verse itself. Kindly be seated, thank you. Obviously, the mix-up is it was part of the italicized, and it seems as if it's part of the verse, but the verse top at the caterpillar hath eaten. I say here, notice they all eat for themselves and do not share even with their young. That's a very um, instructive statement. So that selfishness is the problem with these particular stages, I dare say, of the locust. Everyone eats for himself in order to make sure that it grows. And that really should be the experience of God's people eating of the word of God for ourselves personally that we might grow into the full stature of men and women for Christ. But in the context in which we speak, that is not the issue. And I go on to say here, likewise, the destroyers of the husband-wife relationship are all members of the same family. The destroyers of the husband-wife relationship are, the are all members of the same family. So the locust, the palmer worm, the canker worm, and the caterpillar are all of one family. And that which destroys husband-wife relationship is of one family, and the family is the family of self. Let me repeat that again. Whatever you can find that destroys relationship between husband and wives, there's only one family it is of, and that is of the self family. And that is why relationships are destroyed, because whether it's the little things or the big things, the self family is taking control. Does anyone know that family? Does anyone know that family? As a matter of fact, I should ask conversely or say categorically that family is known by all humanity because this is the issue with humanity. But let me just develop a couple of things before I get where I want to go especially. I say here the palmer worm or the null stage. That is gnawing. Like a rat. That is the palmer worm stage. But note that it is referred to as a pupil stage of the locust. And this is the stage in which nibbling occurs. What do I mean by that? In the husband-wife relationship, this is the stage at which more things begin to come in and start trouble. A little nibbling occurs. Listen further. Apparently little things like fixing the bed. Person jumps off the bed, especially husbands, and the wife is great that every time you come out the bed last, I have to go and make it up. Don't you think that is something that you can do to help relieve my burden and stress? Women are sticklers for that fact. All men are not in that category, but we are speaking generally. Therefore, you who are not in the category, you don't have to be offended. And you who are in the category should not be offended, but should take it as encouragement to do what is right. Spending long periods on the phone. Who knows that will know that. Once upon a time, it was thought that women were the culprits. But now it seems with cell phones especially, the roles are being reversed very quickly. Previously, when it was landlines, women used to quote-unquote hog the show. 
But now with cell phones where you can have, of course, voice or texting, messages, WhatsApp, it seems as both sexes become culpable. What about dropping pieces of clothing on the floor and thinking that because she is your wife, she is your maid? Wives are not maids. And that goes for other spouses and children. While a mother enjoys picking up clothing behind children, the women don't enjoy picking up clothing behind their husbands. And that is saying a lot. But I will go on as we expand on these things. Not helping with the children. And usually that is a man problem. But we have seen a nice change around in our society today in which lots of young men applaudably take their children to their care. They, 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 they can now change their children when many people couldn't change their children previously. And that used to be a weird burden on women. She will have to be doing this. The father might perchance hold the child, but once a bowel movement occurs, come for your son or your daughter. That was usually the response. Right now, it is not as previously. And we men who are married or women who are married, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not married, your comment might be uh, really reminiscent of um, you not know what you're saying, even though you can see what happens. All right. Spending much time or too much time in adorning oneself. Who does that seem to have be appointed to most? All right. I said most. That's why I add the word most. Yes? It is those whom we love to see lovely, Brother Steve. Our wives. And we are men, we men make sure also that we look a okay. Because you can't be having a wife looking good and you looking like a ragamuffin. As a matter of fact, society is so horrible now that that seems to be the end thing. See a lovely woman walking, and you see with a fellow with a pants on his bum and his hair in a kind of a way, and rough and scruffy, as we would say. Things have changed on their head but not necessarily for good in every instance. But let us go on because we have short time to get through a lot of things. And I'm saying these things should be nipped in the bud. All of what I've just said, if they're not nipping the bud, they can be exacerbated to call real problems in a household. And most problems that occur in households start very small. You're willing to ignore them at the first sight of them. But then it begins to burn your belly as the case is. And I like Solomon's statement in Psalm of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. We like to talk about the small forces that this void divine. And this is the text. Catch, the, catch for us the forces. The little forces that ruin the vineyards or vineyards that are in bloom. You see, when your relationship begins to bloom... It is important to hold those little forces and burn them before they burn the relationship. And it is so unfortunate that things like, things that can be easily knocked off are left to quote-unquote fester and bloom and cause separation eventually. Why is the question. Let us proceed. We have the locust stage or the swarmer. You know locusts, how they swarm over a place. It is, in some instances, though, there's a wingless stage called the nymph stage, which grows rapidly and then become adults and move, move around rapidly. So they eat voraciously. They eat everything in the path, grow very quickly, and then fly all over the place and create problems. This is the stage during which things in relationship develop and grow for some time before emerging openly. Things have a way of developing, going on, and sometimes 
blind love, which is not really love, is willing to put up with certain things because they want to accomplish a certain end. But when it begins to burn you, you begin to talk. You see, and again, that is why it is important to nip these things, discuss them with your spouse, if the person has become your spouse, or if not your spouse, but in a to come spousal relationship, you need to sit down and talk these things over. Unfortunately, many people like to let these things slip and do not want to confront. I'm, about, I'm not talking about confrontational now, but confront by discussing things that don't please you. Some people think that, well, when we marry, it will change. I agree it will change, but for the worse as well. Because I've got you now, and you can't tell me now what I should do. And that is why I encourage people when I have the privilege to discuss that communication is the key in the relationship. Once you can communicate and discuss things that are not comfortable, and you can both see where the issues are, you can plan together to move together by making sure that those things no longer come in. Other intimate relationships like close friends or even family, which appear harmless at first, but when they emerge and blossom, they could be earth-shattering. Some relations have people who intrude into the relationship. And these people who intrude don't seem to have I don't want to say a sense, but don't seem to be smart enough to know that these are especially young married people. Give the people space. Give them time to begin to gel. Because the reality is, when you have now married, you don't really know that person to whom you've married. You now have to begin to learn those persons and give the people days and weeks to get the business together in more ways than one, rather than going knocking at the people's house and saying you want to spend time with them in the first two, three weeks. No, people do that. Somebody said to me that my mother-in-laws are notorious for that, but I don't think our mother-in-laws here are of that ilk and kind, but a word is still sufficient for mother-in-laws, which she shall address a little later as well. Mother-in-laws will tell you they want to see things going, with, going good with their daughter particularly and their son especially. But I always like to add this. Were you comfortable when your husband's mother intruded early? You see, there's a problem I want to address. I want, I'll throw it over here now for, on, for, for, for consideration. And it has to do with men and their mothers in their relationship with their wife. And it was because of the experience I had while I was over and away a um, couple of years ago in Jamaica, a question that arose. And it had to do with um, relationships, and people were answering all kinds of things. And it dawned on me immediately that a woman would not want another woman, her son's wife, to treat her husband other than she would want her, daughter, her um, son treated. Is that true, women? Wouldn't you want your son, who is the husband of a young lady, to be well treated? Talk with me a little bit this time around. Right, of course. I have one son, I would like to know if he gets a wife that she is A-OK and treats him better than my wife treats me with A-OK. Prime. But you know what a problem is? Women will want their sons treated by on, but they don't treat their husband that way generally. You think about it. You're gonna tr you want this woman to treat your son really well, but do women treat their husbands really well? And that is where problems can arise and create problems in the families at both the Nora stage and the Swammer stage. So that if you want your son to be well treated by another woman, 
let him see you be treating your husband well as well. Because it is imprinted on the heads of boys the way mommy treats her husband. And that is the way I am to really treat my wife as well. Because men are impacted extremely and significantly by their mothers, you know. And that is why something we have something called mother's boys. But let's go a little further because while I'm, this is a peripheral issue right now, I'm dealing with, I want to get more substantive issue, but I have to, to, to speak to it. The canker worm stage is a stage at which demolition and gobbling occurs. You hear the words used? Demolition and gobbling or bolting. So the house eat down now. The house can get eat down as it were. This is a stage in, the, in a relationship where total risk disregard as the spouse occurs. Because the little things have allowed to develop, to develop. So it now reaches a stage at which you don't really care for her or him. And therefore then you can do everything in your eye in order to destroy, mash up. And completely level the relationship by your attitude to that person, whether male or female. And then finally, the caterpillar, the consumer. I don't know a caterpillar. Man, he wants to eat all the vegetation and leaves in order to come out a wonderful butterfly. But in these relationships, the caterpillar stage don't come out a beautiful butterfly. Very often, it comes out to the destruction of the relationship. You see, the caterpillar eats and eats to grow to, for you to admire. But in the spousal relationship with distinction, it is a real devourer, a consumer. And something here I mention is that this is the ravager stage in which devastation and complete ruin is the experience of the relationship. And the relationship is severed and separation occurs and can end in bitter divorce. Because when that caterpillar finishes with, let's say, a leaf or a, 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 um, a branch, all you have is bare stems or hard things on it. And therefore, if you're not conscious, your experience with the caterpillar will be so consuming that when you look around, you have absolutely nothing in the relationship. So then, we see that these things come in as a result, and the scripture says, that God sent them. And we're going to, of course, clear that myth as well about God sending these things. But I go on now to say, but God has promised, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do what? Great things. Listen to these great things. I will do what? Read with me there. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And listen now. And what? Ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you. Praise God. Now, this is now where the power comes in. After the divorce has occurred, God has promised I will restore. Is that any hope for you believers? You who have relationships that are being devoured, the promise is that God will restore. And more than that, look at what it says here. I will restore to you all the years. Let me say now that some relationship for years have been suffering devouring by the adversary. Anybody know that kind of a thing? Where that you are not enjoying the sweet weeks of a wife-husband relationship, but you are being burnt for years. Things are happening, are coming in your relationship, and you are wondering, oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long will I come, have to bear with this kind of a thing? And the assurance from the word of God is, I will restore a new covenant promise, praise God. 
I say it's a new covenant promise. A promise that God himself said, I will do the restoring. He has restored humanity in Christ already. When you now accept that gift, I can tell you, brethren, God starts restoring in a different way than you think. For those of us, those of you, who years of devastation has occurred, who have grinned and borne it patiently, crying out to God in prayer, you need now to pray for your spouse, that that spouse also would understand that God is willing to and is able to restore that which has been destroyed over the years. And there are some families to whom I speak, and I'm speaking consciously, internationally. There are some of you out there, and some of us, who have experienced burning for years. Many a wife will say, I've been praying that things turn around because I'm not treated like the queen that God designed I to be treated in the family. I'm not respected the way I am. I, I know the word God of God says I'm to be respected. And likewise, men would tell you that my wife drives me like an iron stick into the ground off times. And I seek always to hold my own for God's sake. But there needs relief to come for such persons. And brethren, I bring the news this morning to you that I have been here all camp. God will restore those who desire restoration. And at the end of this service, I believe move upon hearts to determine if they genuinely want restoration. People talk about restoration, but restoration for spousal relationship is not a two-way situation. It's not a one-way situation, rather. It's a situation in which both spouses, being Christians, must desire it if they will have it. A man would not want to know, I am hoping a man who loves God would not want to know that he's going into the kingdom of God and his wife is being burnt in a fire. Who is his next self? And conversely, who woman would want to know she can enter the kingdom of God and my husband is outside being to be burnt in the fire and he is my next self? So what I'm saying to us believers, we need to begin to understand the unity that exists that must exist between husbands and wives. And I want to stick a pen here right now and say this. It is going to be very difficult for a wife or a husband who have not done all in their power to help encourage their spouse into the kingdom of God and expect to be in the kingdom of God. You know, there are many people who pretend, I, I can't use the word pretend because I can't judge people, but there are many people who operate, are very harsh against a husband and wife, but then they're so wonderful Christians. Boy, I check that, huh? How can that be? Have you ever thought about it? You, you love God so intensely, but he doesn't want to see his name on paper. That is a farce, and I'm here to say it categorically because I'm not afraid to have the backing of the word of God. You cannot love God whom you cannot see, and the one this to you, you hate that person. What do you think of that scenario? That's what the apostle John said, you know, but apparently John was addressing the church. But I believe John was addressing the church as family. Oh, I love God. And it would not anything become, come between me and God. But you don't love your husband. You don't love your wife. You don't care for them in the way that God designed them to be cared for. The truth is, I believe you are a bluff in such instances. And your bluff will be called. But it might be too late when it is called. But I go a little further because we have a little to, quite a bit to go and a little time to do it. But notice the order in which God restores. Compare the order in which the devastation occurs and the order in which God restores. It's a different order altogether. You see, God is different. Praise his name. And I use this coinage. Agapely different. Agapely different. Lovingly different in actual fact. Listen how God restores. You will realize that at the first stage, we have the um, palm of worm, which is the stage. 
But in this restoration, it is the locust, the swarmer. So God attacks the big thing first, knowing that if the big thing is attacked, the little thing will fall by the way. Have you ever realized that? That if you've got several problems and you get the major problem solved, the other problems fall into line like clockwork. And this is exactly how God approached it. And therefore, the order is first the removal of the locusts, the swarmer or the horde or the mass, which is the overwhelming problem. That's it. Then it is the removal of the devourer, the canker worm, the powerful destructive entity, that which is eaten away at the family. Then afterwards is the consuming caterpillar, which consumes resources, brain to barrenness and poverty in many instances. So when God addresses the big problem, he then allows the other problems to fall into place. And that is the good news of how God functions. And lastly, the knower, the palm of world, which you will want to remove first, which is the persistent, the irritating situation, is then at last removed. Because once you have removed the devourer, the little nigglings will be removed. And that is exactly how God approaches this. And I stuck in between here something to help. I call it the communication, which is a way to improve relationship. And you know, I believe that vigorously communication because you experience a relationship with God and therefore, you are able to communicate with your spouse. And I have five bullets here that I will just read fairly quick. You don't have time to elaborate because I want to get to the other section. But you should pay attention. For communication, improvement, and relationships, you should find the right time which is agreeable to both of you. So don't come to talk to me about a problem when I'm engaged in an activity that I'm earnestly dealing with. That is not the right time because I'm not going to hear you. That is, I'm not going to spend time to hear you. Secondly, talk of serious matters face to face. There are sometimes you may have to send a letter because sometimes talking face to face, you might get a blowout. So a nice letter sometimes just does it. But it's always wise to be able to talk face to face very candidly. You know that sometimes trying to talk face to face, both of you become very antagonistic and irritable. Once you've gotten past that with the letter, talking face to face now should occur. And then this one do not attack. That sounds like a tat dog, ain't it? Do not attack. Do not say, you rather say I or we. And how often we engage in this. You do so and so and so and so and so and so. Or if you would do different, everything will work. Rather than saying if we can work together, things will work out better. And once you begin to say you to a person, it makes the person go defensive immediately. Because you feel that you are the one under attack when you know that both of you are the problems in the relationship. So if both persons are problems, you can't get on a high horse and say, well, you are the cause of the problem. And by the way, like I said, I don't believe no one person is responsible for a breakdown in a relationship. One might go to the extreme and do certain things, but usually both of them are very often in antagonism and carry the problem a little further. Then we go to be honest, and this one can be hurtful. Be honest. This can be hurtful, but it is the key to a helpful relationship. Do you want to admit that you had a relationship with your wife's best friend to your wife? You can see really how hard that could be. You want to be honest with your wife when you're taking your money and giving it to one of your siblings unknown to her when the house is falling down on your head. And this is what I'm talking about. Rather, you will need to discuss with your spouse before that step is taken. You see, 
Both spouses must agree on these fundamentals. We will give our mom, our dad, this kind of a thing because we recognize our responsibility to them and not as a hide out. Some people hide and do things and don't include the other. And there's nothing worse than hiding. Even if you're honest, hiding makes it look very dishonest. Why would you hide if you're doing something honest, by the way? So that if I'm going to be able to give a person, I said, wait, well, you know, things are this way, and I want to be able to help this person. We are going to help them. But not just, you know, rather take the um, family resources and throw it behind something and then find out you are in trouble in your situation. So it calls for that kind of a thing. And then this last one that I have always to be aware of, your body language. Now, it's not my body language that's a problem. My facial expression is a problem for a lot of people. But sometimes people can misread your facial expression as well. My wife would tell you, if I'm in deep concentration, especially reading, my mouth is as if you will see me if I'm vexed the same way. Because I, I try to understand I have a mouth in a certain situation, and people assume that you're angry. And that is why you have to learn to judge righteous judgment. And not again according to appearance or your hearing of the ears. But it's said time we have a responsibility to have a cheerful and pleasant countenance. I plead guilty, pray for me. But let's go further now as we have our last couple of moments. We are aware of what um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. He says here, And unto the martyr they command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. That is a, a statement that God enjoins on his children in their spousal relationship. Woman, do not leave your husband. There's no reason for leaving your husband. A husband, do not put away your wife. There's no reason for putting away your wife. Somebody say if adultery occurs, let me go a little further. But to the rest he said, I speak not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Somebody asked me, so if something else than adultery is occurring, I shouldn't divorce that man. Well, I want peace and I want joy in my soul. He deserves to be put away because he ain't any use. Let's go further. If anybody have a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. The unbelieving wife is what? Read that for me kindly. The unbelieving wife is? A brother is not under obligation in such cases. That is, if a woman leaves you, well, you have no choice in that respect. But you are not to chase her away. But God has called us to peace. How knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Do we love our wives? That's a question that can be answered overtly, but most people answer it hiddenly. Do we love our husbands? Do we love our wives? Do we love our husbands? So if a husband is unfaithful, as an unfaithful partner, the first reaction is to dispense of him, true or false. The first reaction is to dispense of him, true or false. I say no on the authority of God's word. Love does not operate like a pipe. You could turn off a pipe and it stops immediately. When you are hurt, love does not stop loving the one who hurts you. Therefore, even though a spouse is unfaithful, you don't have the right to decide, I will get rid of you because you're unfaithful. But you are to do like what God does because we are his children Seek to wind, forgive that person, and seek to bind that person again. If perchance, like Lucifer, that person is, I don't really want you again, you have no choice but to let them go. But be not like them, 
that they have gone, and you say, aha, thank God for he gone. I didn't want to see his name on paper. Therefore, I'm not even praying for him any longer. What or wherein lies the character of God, character of God believers? Wherein lies the character of God? When because you have been offended once or even twice or thrice, that you decide, I got my time now, out you go. Does God operate that way? Talk with me, believers, please. Why do we operate that way? Is it because we don't have our father's life or our father's DA in us? That we are not tolerant or caring enough at least to give another chance? But hasn't God given humanity another chance in Jesus Christ? It doesn't seem as if God gave that chance at all. People know that God gave a second chance. What about us? Should I give my spouse a second chance? And the second chance don't necessarily mean a one chance, you know. I rather mean a second chance, rather a second chance. You see, brethren, many of us bring burdens on ourselves by hasty decisions. We do not stand back a little bit and see if I can be a contributor to the problem. But I have to rush on because I've got about three minutes now calling about the murder. I want to go to something very quickly. I'm so unfortunate. Well, no problem. Now, in terms of the husband, on page 44, I have here about honoring the wife, according to Apostle Peter. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. I just want to make a comment concerning honor. You know, the never place in which honor is used is really the fifth commandment. You remember what the fifth commandment says? Honor thy father and thy mother. And my question to you, do you think that what the apostle is saying about honor your wife is um, similar to what he's saying honor your parents? Very much so. You proceeded and came out of your parent being born of your parent. But when you marry a wife, you are so joined to a wife that you are closer to a wife or a husband than you could have been to your mother or father. And, and let me tease and show you what I mean. It is not intended to be um, a bad comment, but you know how minds can be. Would you give your mom or dad what you call a French case? No. Never one brother says. That shows an actual fact that the relationship between the wife and the husband is much deeper than that of the father and the mother and the child. You know what I'm saying there? It is such an intimate experience that you cannot share it with a mother or father, but you share it with your spouse. And that is why the honoring of a husband or a wife is to be much greater than that of a mother or father. And we know how we honor our parents. Oh, that I could get you to understand that your wife or your husband is the one person that is to be esteemed just below God. In your experience. God first, your husband or wife next, and all other come a distant fruit, second or third. So the honoring of the wife suggests to you that since you cannot be intimate with your parents, the intimacy that goes with your wife must supersede that of the parent, and therefore, the relationship with your wife is to be on par with none else. Only second to the relationship you have with God. And believers, do any of you, do any of us have that kind of relationship with our partner? Would to God the answer is yes, and yes with an honest yes. Or if our parents were around or whatever, while we will have a deep, intimate relationship with them, we will have a better relationship with them than with our spouse. I am here, brethren, on this, I believe, the Spirit of God, informing us that a man or a woman who does not love his wife as Christ loves the church is not yet prepared for the latter rain. There will be no latter rain in actual fact except a revival and relationship, spousal relationship, and God's family occurs. It cannot happen, believers. So if we are praying for the latter end of fall, which has begun to fall already, 
and your relationship with your husband or wife is flat on the ground, you will never receive an ounce of rain from God. Attend first to the things that must be attended to, and you will be blessed by God. So, we are going to start there of necessity. We have to start there of necessity, then I must say. But I want to throw this. I want to throw this out. My voice is really good, but I know we want to get through the, um, the system. In conclusion, as I'm told, my time has elapsed. Ten minutes to nine minutes to. I want us to consider by way of expression outwardly. If you are really genuinely earnestly desirous of having that relationship with your spouse that is a replica of the relationship that we as individuals should have with Jesus Christ. Let me say the hand of those who are spouses who would desire that. Well, we've got a couple of spouses that our hands are going up. Very good. Praise the Lord. And I am sure that God has seen your hands. But I want only spouses to proceed to this place right now. And I'm going to beg you for two or three minutes more believers. And this is not a short issue here at all this morning. Because I know our church desired a lot of rain experience. But I'm suggesting no rain will fall if that relationship is on the ground. And you're not seeking to recapture it in Jesus Christ and have it restored. Because I want us to pray together. Because I am in this thing with you. And I believe that our relationship can go to a level that can influence this church. That is, our family spousal relationship in our homes can go to a level that it will be seen that the latter rain is falling in our homes and hence the church, the corporate body, will be benefited. Would you just want to repair her with me, brethren? Or you think holding your hands is good enough? If so, you can just remain, you know. All right, thank you for coming. And I believe that um, we are in earnest. I believe that the families in this church are serious about wanting spousal relationship to be really where it ought to be. Husband and wife, brother Kamal. Yeah. And therefore, what I'm saying is that we have to consider this thing very deeply. It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow before God and break it. I say it again. Don't feel under pressure because your husband or wife is out here. It would be better not to come if you're not serious than to come and then tomorrow you are throwing stones at each other. I will pray and ask God's spirit to make intercession for us before he's thrown. Because I believe that this is where it starts in our church. In the family, between husbands and wives. And if we don't get it right, our children will not get it right. And therefore, our influence would be just like a fleeting shadow. Pretty in the church congregation, but at home, the devour is working mightily. Let us pause for prayer, believers. Our Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit's impacting your word upon our consciences. We know, dear Lord, that a man's voice is only here in the external ear, but in our consciences, your Spirit speaks to us, and we thank you. Father, we are conscious that we need... We need, dear Lord, the outpouring of your Holy Spirit and latter rain measure at this time. As we see that we are not sufficient, dear Lord, to contend with the forces of evil. But you are making it clear to us, we cannot love you and do despite and disgrace and dishonor to our spouses. And then, therefore, then be ready to receive your outpouring. Cause us to see it from the perspective, dear Lord, of the pain that you have been enduring for all eternity to bring complete redemption, including, dear Lord, 
perfection of our experience in Jesus Christ. We pray for families here this morning, all of our families, husbands and wives, who might be having difficulties, dear Lord, and you know them. And they also know their problems that they are having. We know the problems that we are having. And we are asking, dear Father, through the surrender of our souls this morning, to come in more mightily and platter your spirit of agape love that our human love between spouses might be undergirded and indeed be strengthened and seeing their Lord to take on a new direction because of that love. While words fail their father, you read the very hearts of every one of us. And we thank you that your spirit is making intercessions before your throne for us, especially in this area. So remember families, remember spouses. Grant that wives might learn to respect and be so submissive to their husbands that it will cause a turnaround in this place. That husbands will so love and care for their wives as their own selves that our children, that our larger church family might see there goes the family blessed by God, by the love of God. Oh, Father, not because of our words, but we lay hold upon you in faith, knowing that that which you have promised, and you've promised to restore families, and we claim that promise now in the name of Jesus, with thankfulness. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, believers, husbands and wives. Remember, the impact is on our children. And once our children can be correctly impacted, you can be sure that the revival of restoration of good relationship in the family is on and God is blessing. God bless. Thank you. Have a 